as you can probably hear, it's you know definitely uh, Bay Area inspired. Uh, my my brother and I were were big into uh, you know Bay Area thrash and you know even like uh, Sepultura and stuff like that when it was you know it was you know man it was the it was the 80s man you know it was the <laughs> 80s and early 90s so uh, when we got together and and that's kind of where it was where it was at I, and I was I was kind of going from a from doing, I don't know. I was, I was, I had done some, you know, rock stuff, and we had done versions of, and we, we, we did do covers of like uh, Metallica and Slayer and stuff like that. Um, but I was kind of trying to find my, kind of trying to find my voice, you know, and uh, so I was, I was mixing it up a little bit. Uh, but most of it is definitely, you know, Bay Area thrash. I, I, I liked, I, I really, really liked Forbidden. Um, and I was, I, oh, I, yeah. I really dug what Russ Anderson was doing. Cause I, I think that he did, he did a nice combination between like stuff like, uh, like what Chuck Billy was doing in the low range. And then he was like throwing in his hot, you know, some highs in there and stuff. And that, that was just really cool stuff, man. Those, those first two Forbidden records were really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, I was kind of definitely inspired by that. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the, the classic, uh, guys I was inspired by as well, you know, uh, Halford and, and Dickinson and, and things like that. Although, you know, I, I always, I definitely always kind of related, I guess, more to Halford. Cause I think that Halford actually probably has more of a natural, um, bass voice and he, and, and his, you know, his highs were definitely, um, you know, falsetto ish, you know, going the falsetto, you know, you know, high, or high, high end, uh, head, uh, area. And, um, you know, Bruce was sort of not, he was just a, a tad out of where I felt comfortable singing a lot of times. Um, so I, you know, that, that's, that's kind of where I was, where I was at with that. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I really liked, I really liked Russ Anderson and, and, uh, that, worked out um because that's how that's how i got introduced to uh to iced earth is uh the 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 drummer uh rodney beasley he he played in a band um that was jamming in the same uh like storage units that that cauldron was was jamming in and he he gave my name to uh to john and then i went up and tried out for iced earth so that was kind of how it how it worked out now he's i think he he told John that I I kind of had a uh, King Diamond type falsetto when I, I guess <laughs> I, which I guess is good um, to a you know I I mean I I certainly appreciated that because I always dug, dug King but I, John was never really a big King fan so I'm glad that he didn't he didn't just you know shoot him down and go ah you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, okay, it sounds like King Diamond I don't want to you know I don't want to hear him um, but uh, yeah so. You know, went up there and did some stuff, and uh, I, I, I remember, you know, he gave me like the first two records, and and I was trying to, trying to do what the, kind of a, com- a combination of what, uh, Gene Adam was doing, and 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 uh, John Greeley, and I don't know, I don't know if I pulled it off, you know, great, but I I, I tried to make it my own, and uh, and I guess it it worked out well enough that I got the gig, so. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where that was at. And, you know, like I said, you know, definitely not, uh, ashamed of the cauldron stuff. Um, not at all. It's kind of where, where I was, where I was at and that, and it definitely helped, uh, helped me to go in the direction that I, that I went in. Yeah, it's definitely fun stuff, you know. I think it's interesting you mentioned King Diamond because I'm a real big fan of cool. him too. Right but I, I do think it's uh, interesting that you pointed that out because of the fact that when you listen to some of those Burnt Offering songs, you do actually sound a little bit more like him on the really high notes, yeah. Yeah. which you really don't on the albums after that. So it's yeah. like, there's like a change there. Well, yeah, and I think, the, I think the big change there is that I I was really trying to find my 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 falsetto at that point, you know, where, where I was and what I could do with it. And, and it was, so it, it probably ends up sounding a little cleaner, like King Diamond stuff does, you know, I mean, his, his, his highs are really, really high and really, really clean. 
and for the you know for the most part, and may, they may have gotten a little bit dirtier as he's gotten a little bit older, um, and maybe that's part of what what it is for for me as well. But but I also kind of feel like I like I, I like the little bit of more dirt on mine now. You know what I mean? Kind of like you know a little Ian Gillenish kind of you know that kind of warbly uh, grittier uh, falsetto y stuff, um, and that's kind of what I like to hear. So I, I try to stay away from the really high clean unless it's, unless it's a, unless I'm layering in a harmony or something like that. And it's just, and it's not going to be a lead vocal, but for a lead vocal, I kind of like it a little bit grittier because I think it kind of distinguishes itself as more of a lead, I guess maybe just, you know, personal preference on that. Yeah, I can hear that. It's, it's definitely, uh, it's got a more aggressive sound too that way, which definitely helps because a lot of times the stuff you're singing over is pretty aggressive sounding music. Right, you know? So, right. um, so I can definitely see how that would become the preference for that reason as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how with, with, with that, like you were talking about the, you know, adding the, the dirt on the, on the high stuff. It, it is interesting how you, sometimes you do have that trans transition thing. A lot of guys don't do, which is you go from, that you know, like that mid-rangey kind of growling, you know, like not growling, but the you know the the gritty mid-range stuff, and then you still have the rasp on the higher end, but it's like a totally different kind. You know, most people usually just have like one kind of distortion they use, and they just use it through their whole range. But you kind of have like multiple kinds. I think that's kind of a an interesting difference about your vocal style. Yeah, well, I I think it's just you know where I've come to feel, you know feel comfortable about it because I I definitely want that that shift to be comfortable from one to the other. And I don't want there to get like a little hang up in there. So maybe it's just where it just that that transition is also, pro, you know, pro, because I do I am transitioning is probably part of it. And like I'm finding a different spot, you know, where I, it feels comfortable and I'm not going to get like get my voice kind of caught in that because that does happen sometimes, too. Like, you know, if you if you're not, you know, thinking about it, like, you know, making a, a, a definite mental effort to uh, place where your voice is or what you're doing with it, you, you can get kind of trapped and, uh, and not, not make that, that transition cleanly. So uh, that's the kind of way, what I always think about when I'm, when I'm practicing is like, okay, you know, kind of like you, you know, you, you, uh, you train like you fight or, you know, you, or you fight like you train. That's that, that, that whole kind of that idea or mindset. So if I'm doing that, you know, efficiently and, and over and over again in practice, then I'm going to do that live and it's going to, you know, there's going to be that smooth changeover. And, and that's kind of what I always kind of, kind of thinking about that. And if you, if you, if you're doing that when you're practicing, then you're, it, it, it's not even a thought when you do it live, you know, you can think about other things like, you know, where you are with the band or for communicating with the crowd or whatever. And, and so there, you're going to have that more of that natural, natural, uh, change over there. Yeah, that's good. You know, you just have it like built in at that point, probably. Right, right. Uh, do you use that? Do you do like warm ups still? Like, is that something you still do regularly before you're going to go perform, or is, or do you not really have to do that as much anymore because you've sang so much? Yeah, I, well, I think I think as you're you know before uh, any any live uh, show, if you're if you're doing show after show, you know back to back shows, you probably don't need really need to do that. Um, usually, like a sound check is good that it usually kind of breaks up the crap and gets everything kind of where you, where you want it to be. Um, but, uh, it, you know, before, before a tour or something like that, I definitely try to, uh, practice kind of the same way that I'm going to perform. So also, you know, I, I don't, I don't really get into, to doing the, doing the scales and all that other good stuff. Um, I think just, you know, that practical, um, application, you know, definitely works. And that was something else that, uh, you know, Al Cohen, you know, kind of passed on to me, even, you know, as a vocal coach, he's like, you know, if you're out there, you're hammering it for, you know, an hour and a half or two hours of a show. Um, and, you know, then the next night you're getting ready to do the same thing. You, you don't want to sit there for a half hour before doing scales and stuff like that. You know, you just, you know, go out there and do it. You know, your voice knows what to do and, you know, you're, you're ready, you know, you don't need to, to do it, um, because you're, you shouldn't have to anyway, you know, you, if you're performing, just go out there and, you know, knock the cobwebs off for a sound check or whatever, and then, then jump right into it. And it, it that's always seemed to, 
to have worked for me. Um, as a, you know, as a, I can't really say as I'm getting older, maybe that will change. Maybe I'll need to you know stretch things out a little bit more than that. But it seems to uh, to pan out so far. So he didn't actually like have you do a bunch of warm ups or scales or stuff like that. He was like, uh, um, he, he did. He did as far as where you know trying to figure out where my voice was. You know, when I was working on my voice and expanding my range, you know, he was like, yes, you know, definitely, you know, work on this when you're not performing. But when you're performing, you know, and you're performing, you know, you're doing shows back to back to back. Don't don't sit there and do scales. You know, uh, your you know your voice is you, you know what you're doing. You're 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 trained, you know, you're, you're ready to go. Um, and you should be fine. You know, that should be enough of a workout every day, you know, uh, to, to keep your voice where you want it to be. So I always kind of, you know, took heed to that and, and went with that. And I'm not saying that that's going to be right for, for every vocalist and every, you know, every situation, but, uh, I, I just found that it kind of works for me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good to hear that too. Because some people talk about, you know, they some people do lots of warm ups, and some people like, uh, I think it was Meatloaf said uh, he never does anything to prepare his voice. <laughs> he just, you know, just goes in and sings. So it's kind of interesting that you know. Yeah, well, and I think to, to compare that stuff. Well, and that's the whole thing as far as, um, you know, difference between I guess preparing and repairing. I mean, nothing, you know. I don't think that anything's going to really repair your voice other than just not singing and not talking, you know? Um, uh, and, and sometimes that's absolutely what you need uh, to do, you know, between if you, you know, especially if you're, if you're in a bad spot where, you know, you're, you're sick or whatever. I mean, I've, I've sang plenty of times when I was sick and I sang fine, but then I get, I get off and I, and I can't talk because I'm, you know, I can't speak in a, like a talk, a talking voice because, that's just, that part's just wrecked, you know, and you, so you're, it's, it's bizarre, but, um, but you can do that. You can definitely sing. And my, my, like I said, my sister-in-law, she was a, a really good example like of uh, that. She'd be sick, sound like crap, you know, sound like she's got a frog in her voice, but then go out and be able to perform because you're using a different, you know, different set of tools there. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, I I definitely would say that resting uh, is a definitely a big thing, um, and I I always definitely try to do that if if I'm out on tour or whatever, man. You know, definitely get eight eight or more hours of sleep if you can, um, because that's the only thing that's going to really help repair um, any damage that you've done. And, and chances are, you know, you're going to do some damage if you're up there, you know, belting out metal. You're you're definitely going to wear your you know wear on yourself and uh, um, you know, but just try to rest and let your body repair itself and don't, don't over, don't overdo, don't talk too much, um, to people. And that's a, another hard thing to do when you're on the road. Cause you know, you're out there and you're hanging out with guys that, you know, guys in your band, maybe some, some guys that you don't see all the time. Like, you know, like in my, me, you know, my situation, I don't see, I don't get to see and talk to Van or, or Freddie a lot. And, and, uh, you know, so you end up talking maybe more than you should, um, but uh, it's something to, something to keep in mind as well. Just kind of just woo and have some quiet time and uh, let your let your voice heal itself. Yeah, it's cool to hear that coming from you too, because I always wondered about the fact that you know a lot of singers who have to sing a lot of demanding material and they do it all the time. Like you know, after a certain number of years go by, their voices do start to deteriorate mm -hmm. a bit. But I've never noticed yours, your voice doing that, you know. And I thought, well, does he have like some mysterious Holy Grail technique figured out so that it doesn't like fatigue the voice at all? But I thought I think it's interesting that you say it still does, regardless. Sure. You know? Yeah, ab absolutely, it, it does. And I think as you as you get older, it's gonna it's gonna t you know just like any anything else, you know, it takes me a lot longer um, as I've gotten older to to heal from an injury or you know from you know whatever. It's just that's just the way it is, man. You know, as you get older, it, it takes longer to to do that. I've I've also had the the benefit of, you know, and I haven't had a I haven't had a tour like a lot of these other bands. You know, a lot of the guys that are out there just hammering it out, and it's amazing to me that that they can that they can do it and as much as they've as they've done, and uh, probably you know abused their voices, not intentionally abused them, but just from purely 
playing metal for all these years and doing so many tours, 